Welcome and thank you for joining us for this VCA ACs webinar on face transplantation. This webinar is the third session in a multi webinar series on VCA for the transplant community, the need and the achieved debunking the myths. This webinar series is presented by the ASD Vascular Composite Allotransplant Transplant Advisory Council. I will now turn the session over to our moderator, Dr. Rolf Barth, to begin our presentation. Thank you, and welcome for all of you joining us online. Uh, my name is Rolf Barth. I'm a professor of surgery, actually an abdominal transplant surgeon, but I uh, have my research area and clinical research has been in facial transplantation. I'm currently at the University of Chicago as the Associate Director of the Transplant Institute. Um, and I'm very interested to, to hear our two presenters today talk about the, their experiences with two different approaches uh, at two different institutions towards facial transplantation. I think you all will very much enjoy uh, their comments and insights into developing these programs. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Samir Mardini, who's a professor and chair of the Division of Plastic Surgery at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. He is the director of the Facial Paralysis and Reanimation Clinic, co-director of the Cleft and Craniofacial Clinic, and the surgical director of the Center for Reconstructive Transplantation. He completed his training at Georgetown and has done fellowships in craniofacial and reconstructive microsurgery. His primary clinical focus is on craniofacial surgery uh, with research interests on facial nerve, face transplantation, and regenerative medicine. He's published over 150 peer-reviewed articles and will talk to us today on their experience with his team uh, on face transplantation. Dr. Mardini? Well, thank you so much for your kind introduction. I wanna thank the American Society of Transplantation for setting up this webinar and, and allowing me this opportunity. I wanna thank uh, Dr. Rolf Barth for uh, the kind introduction for moderating the session. Today, I wanna to talk to you about face transplantation, uh, which is a procedure that is in the new um, it's also a procedure that has a lot of controversy around it. And I think it's important to try to understand the, how the field evolved, what kind of patients would benefit from face transplantation and where we are today within in the field. So I think given the fact that it's a new field, it's really important to learn from other people's, you know, what they've learned from their mistakes, what they've learned from their, uh, the things that they've done correctly, and and at society meetings, we you know we have the opportunity to uh, meet with other surgeons from around the world and talk to them about these things, and these, these opportunities are uh, incredible. Here you can see uh, Dr. Pomahak, uh, Dr. Seminow, and my friend Dr. Ninkovich, uh, all uh, dear friends and colleagues, and people that have uh, been incredibly open uh, about sharing their uh, their thoughts about the field of face transplantation. Uh, and, and we've been working together to advance. Uh, you can see Dr. Julian Prebez as well, uh, uh, Dr. Pomahak's team. I had the opportunity to visit Dr. Pomahak and Dr. Prebez at Brigham and Women's a few years ago. Uh, this was probably in 2010. And look at this, they were kind enough to bring in two patients for us to talk to them. And uh, when we're trying to bring this, uh, this procedure to Mayo Clinic, you can imagine how important it is to understand what the patients are going through. And the fact that they allowed us this opportunity was truly incredible. Uh, Professor Lantieri in France and his first patient, Pascal, uh, this was also 2010, 2011. Um, and you can see here with uh, Professor Semina, I was sitting with her on the computer presenting patients to her, talking to her about uh, whether she thought those patients were good candidates and, and, uh, and she was kind enough to share her thoughts. And more recently, Adam Mesijowski uh, from Poland, uh, we've had, become really close friends and have talked a lot about different cases. But the field of face transplantation, um, it, we take a different route. We're, we're plastic surgeons, we're head and neck reconstructive surgeons, but we do free tissue transfer. So we, we reconstruct parts of the body with other parts of the body, that's an auto transplant. Uh, we do craniofacial surgery. So um, like children with deformed heads and different skull uh, and facial deformities, uh, facial nerve surgery, facial aesthetic surgery, all of those things come together to allow you to do a procedure of face transplantation. So here's a patient. Uh, she was referred to me for face transplantation. When you look at her, she's missing parts of the face. Uh, you can see here there is a deformity for sure, 
Uh, but she was someone that didn't require face transplantation with a, with a, our conventional reconstructive techniques of uh, reconstructing the manual, mandible with fibula bone. Uh, she's improved and now we need to provide more soft tissue and that avoids the whole face transplantation with immunosuppression that goes along with it. You can see here, these are the parts that she's missing and we can still do some more work to give her an improvement. What about this patient? Uh, first of all, he's a child. You know, we have not done face transplantation in a child. There's a lot of issues with that. And you're, you're familiar with the issues with uh, children and teenage as they go through teenage years and the, the challenges of making a decision for them that commits them to lifelong immunosuppression. Uh, but the, the deformity itself, uh, parts of the face are affected. The neck is constricted. You can see there's a lot of drooling. Um, and this is someone that was not interested in face transplantation, the family as well. Um, and we did a expanded periscapular flap and you can see him 10 years later, he's doing well. He doesn't even think about his deformity at this point. Uh, he's adapted well in life and we'll see at some point if he comes back asking for more, I still think uh, other procedures would be um, the conventional methods, not, not face transplantation for him. Here's another patient referred to us for face transplantation. He was actually on the list for face transplant at another place. Um, and when we saw him, you know, he does not have a bony deformity. Uh, his skeleton is completely intact. He's blind. Um, and he's got, he's missing a nose and an upper lip. So our plan right now is to reconstruct him with uh, a three-stage nasal reconstruction uh, and then do something for his uh, upper lip as well. Uh, but face transplantation is not really in a plan for him in, in, our, in, our, for, in our program. Uh, this is another patient. Uh, with uh, a facial deformity. She has uh, uni unilateral neurofibromatosis. You can see here a pretty significant deformity. Uh, these, this involves a bony skeleton as well. Procedure after procedure, each one 10 hour procedure with a lot of blood loss. Um, you can see here, we've removed some of the uh, facial uh, tumor. Uh, we've done a little bit of uh, debulking. We've reconstructed here the mandible with a implant. Uh, you can start to see her having some form to her face and some structure, uh, but she's missing an orbit and an orbital prosthesis. So in order to put an orbital prosthesis, you need an orbit. So we created a, um, a orbital prosthesis mirrored from the contralateral side. Uh, we placed it, she had complications. We performed a couple of free flaps uh, to get that reconstructed several years later. She's uh, infection free, much better than before, but still asking when she's gonna look normal. Uh, this is what she looks like today, uh, obviously better than before, but she's not where she wants to be and she's asking about something else. Would she be a candidate for face transplantation? And if we did it, would we do half the face? You can see here uh, the, would, you know, an illustration of what we would do if we decided to focus on the face, the, face, the side of the face that's, in, that's involved with tumor. Uh, in that case, we would remove all the structures that are involved uh, with the tumor, including our reconstructions. We would go to the donor, procure all the tissues we need, including the bones, the skin, the muscles, and then we would transplant that. But in the base, best case scenario, you'd have a midline incision, you'd have an asymmetry and function, you'd have a difference in the color because we want to match the color, we want to match the shape, the, 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 the function, all of those things would be imperfect. Uh, would we be better off than going and doing the entire face instead of trying to focus on the side that's involved? This way we'd be able to hide the incisions, better location, match color, match symmetry. Um, and so you can see here on the, on the affected side, we do the same thing we talked about. On the normal side, we remove all the skin. We'd leave the functional muscles. We'd go to the donor, procure all the tissues we need. And then when we inset it on the affected side, we would connect the nerves on the um, normal side. We would not connect the nerves and let the normal muscles function underneath uh, the skin that was transfer transplanted. <clears throat> Here's another patient, a, a Colombian soldier, um, came to us after a blast injury to the face and a latissimus myocutaneous flap. You can see he has a blob of tissue on his face. Uh, it has no form, no structure. Um, so we, we, you can see what is missing there. We went and did uh, um, osteointegrated implants to, to place an orbital prosthesis. And then we got him this prosthesis that looks reasonable, much better than what he looked like before. And the procedure of debulking the, the flap to allow for this to, to, to be placed is about five procedures. Uh, and you can see here um, in the prosthesis what it looked like. And 
we had a plan for him if we were to do face transplant, what he would, what the face transplant would entail. So one option would be targeting the area that's involved. And you can see here, we remove all the tissues that are involved uh, with the trauma. Uh, we leave some of the muscles that have function. You can see here, we left the orbicularis oris. We go to the donor, procure the muscle, the tissues that we need, and then selectively innervate the parts of the face that, uh, that require function. But the incisions would be in unfavorable locations, right in the middle of the face, in the middle of the forehead. Um, would we be better off removing all the tissues on the face, um, including, um, including the, um, the normal skin? And you can see here, putting the incisions in favorable locations. We'd still be able to leave the muscles that are functional um, as, the, as, the muscles that, as the muscles that would provide function for the newly transplanted face. But then that would depend on which, which muscles we decide to innervate. On the normal side, you'd, on, the, on the donor, you'd procure all the tissues you need, and then you'd uh, selectively innervate the parts of the face that require function. You could see here better symmetry, better form, better uh, uh, location of, uh, of the incisions. This is a patient that had a uh, electric burn, pretty significant electric burn. You can see here, this is how he presented to us. After uh, multiple debridements, uh, we decided to uh, perform a free tissue transfer. You can see our vastus lateralis mycotaneous flap uh, was uh, transferred. Uh, this is what he looked like two months later. Uh, and he's a candidate for face transplantation. Uh, he's still missing uh, parts of the face. Uh, and at that moment, he was not, sure he wanted to undergo face transplantation, which just wants to go back to work. Uh, he's not focused on his look. So I, in these patients, emergency face transplantation, which has been done before uh, in our program is not an appropriate uh, thing for certain patients because in some cases like this patient is an obvious candidate in our minds, but it's not obvious for him. Uh, this is another patient with uh, facial deformity. You can see missing parts of the face. This patient would be a candidate. He requires eyelids, nose, upper jaw, um, and the mid face. So you can see here, no conventional technique is gonna give you a, uh, a result that's similar to face transplantation. Of course, the patient has to be willing to undergo immunosuppression. Uh, this is a candidate for a pediatric face transplantation. The patient's missing the entire lower face. You can see the orifice uh, of the oral orifice is tiny. You can see uh, there's some movement there, uh, but missing the lower jaw completely. Uh, but this is a young patient. And uh, again, pediatric face transplantation is still controversial. The procedure is high risk, requires immunosuppression. There's been seven deaths. Each death has been for a different reason. Uh, some have been uh, infection related, uh, some have been recurrence of a tumor in a patient that's undergone a transplant with a history of a tumor. Uh, some have been uh, self-inflicted injuries and uh, so on. Two of the patients that have had face transplantation out of the 48 have been retransplanted, meaning that they had the trans face transplant, they lived with it for a few years, they started rejecting it, that, that, that face transplant was removed, waiting, and then he was put, the patient was put back on the list and underwent another face transplantation as a salvage procedure. So it is important to look at the patient's perspective and the program's perspective. From the patient's perspective, uh, the patient has to reach a point where he totally understands, he or she totally understands what the procedure is all about, what they're putting themselves through. The lifelong immunosuppression is important. Uh, the patient has to be medically fit for the procedure. The patient has to be psychologically stable and able to have a good su support network. Um, they have to accept the risk and the patient has to be brave to undergo a procedure like this. On the team side, the anatomy um, has to be, uh, has to be uh, that, for, uh, that requires a face transplantation. Uh, we have to have a team. Uh, the transplant infrastructure is important. So we have to have solid organ team, we have to have uh, uh, transplant physicians, all of that, in order to be able to do vascularized composite tissue allo transplantation. And then the team really has to be willing to embark on this journey with the patient. There's a lot of troubles that come along the way and it has to be a, a, a journey that's, that's uh, sustainable. Mayo Clinic is one of the places that is able to form teams. And uh, in, in our case, you can see here, incredible people across the, in, the entire spectrum of transplant surgery outside of the actual surgeons performing the procedure. 
Uh, you can see our, our cardiac surgeons, our cardiac physicians, uh, transplant physicians, our infectious disease specialist, uh, our medical physician, uh, Dr. Amara, just incredible people uh, and anesthesiologists here that, that have been willing to join us in embarking on this journey. Uh, our team from LifeSource, incredible group of people that have learned everything they need to learn about this, uh, this um, field in order to help us and help our patients. Uh, we started as a clinical program in 2013. We were not a research program, although we have research uh, protocols uh, on face transplantation. The program itself and the procedure itself is a clinical program. Um, the, the, uh, the team involves way more people than just the surgeons and the physicians. Uh, you can see here uh, everybody across the institution, um, uh, you know, all the teams across the institution were involved, our patient uh, was 21 when he was in a bad place, um, drinking, self-inflicted injury. You can see here multiple debridements, um, vascularized fibula for mandible, vascularized iliac for maxilla. Uh, he left the hospital a month later. Uh, you can see on the left was, a, was his picture before the uh, it trauma, on the right after all the reconstructions. Uh, you can see uh, telecanthus, a, a nasal prosthesis, microstomia, you can see the fibula skin island with, with hair on it. Um, and this patient we followed for years. And at one point we started talking about the option of face transplantation. You can see here, uh, he's able to have, he has some function of his face. Uh, he's got a significant deformity involving multiple structures. He's able to close his eye. He's able to op uh, lift up his eyebrows. We, want, we didn't want to uh, destroy those functions when we talked about face transplantation. He had all the nerves. Uh, that he needed to get a good result with face transplantation. But we still looked at him and asked every time, is he someone that we should continue on the journey of conventional techniques? So we mapped that out. It would be a uh, nasal reconstruction phase, which would require a vascularized radial forearm flap for inner lining, um, a uh, cartilage graft for structure, and then a forehead flap for outer lining. Um, he would need also sphincter reconstruction of the, the oral sphincter reconstruction. So we would use his current lower lip for upper lip, and then we'd re reconstruct the lower lip with a, a uh, Ninkovich procedure, which is uh, gracilis innervated, a uh, gracilis muscle innervated by marginal mandibular nerve uh, to create some function. And then he'd go through the phase of oral uh, dental rehabilitation, which would require distracting the, um, the neo, man, neo maxilla, placing osteointegrated implants, and then a prosthesis. And then we thought with all these procedures, he'd look like something on the right. And then we were hoping with face transplantation, he would look like something what you see on the right with less procedures. So we went to the cadaver lab. We spent about 50 Saturdays in the cadaver lab rehearsing, uh, understanding the anatomy, dwelling over every detail. You can see here the facial nerve branches are all mapped out. And on the donor, we cut the facial nerve proximal. Uh, we expose the sensory branches. You can see here the inferior alveolar, the lingual, the sensory nerve supplying the buccal mucosa. Um, we the infraorbital nerve, we dissect it out as proximal as possible and cut it. This is on the donor. And then on, the, on our patient, he has an intact lacrimal uh, system. Uh, so what we would need to do is, since we're transplanting the, the nose and the lac, we would need to connect the patient's lacrimal system to the donor lacrimal system. So we ended up uh, suturing lacrimal sac to lacrimal sac. Um, this was the patient's uh, 3D model uh, after the injuries and the reconstruction. And then we had a virtual uh, model of what we would like to have the patient uh, bony skeleton look like after the transplant. So we had something to aim for. We performed virtual surgical planning with our team and 3D systems, medical modeling. You can see here, this is the actual virtual surgical plan for our patient. Uh, we, in the cadaver lab, we did this for every cadaver session. We did this about 17 cadaver sessions uh, to, to rehearse all the details and understand what was required for the actual transplant. We refined the guides time after time. Um, and then you could see here, we were able to, we were able to print models that allow us to pre-bend plates. Our protocol was completely uh, mapped out and established step-by-step. Step. Our, our procedure started Friday night at around midnight. You can see here with an incredible group of people there, including our medical physicians on Friday night, just being there to support us. This is the briefing prior to the procedure, the pause prior to procuring the, the donor face. Uh, and then we had the procedure of transplantation occurring in the uh, next, door, next door room. 
uh, where the patient was started, the procedure was started on the patient. We had a briefing for that room as well. Dr. Daly, uh, cardiac surgeon, came to help us uh, uh, deal with some of the issues involved with the, with the other teams procuring organs. Um, you can see some of the steps uh, exposing the facial nerve branches, stimulating the facial nerve branches on the donor, and then mapping out exactly what each branch did, partly smile, partly uh, eyelid closure, and, and, and tagging these nerves so that we know exactly which nerve did what uh, function. Uh, this did, was done on the, on the donor and on the recipient. You can see the organ uh, that, that was to be transplanted uh, on the recipient. There's different steps of the procedure. You can see here we do, we have steps of, that we do for points of return and points of no return, meaning that uh, because they, the donor for our face uh, is a, also a donor for many of the other organs, and we started the procedure of face transplantation don uh, procurement, prior to other solid organs, we do not want to compromise the life-saving organs uh, that, that, are, uh, that are needed. So we had uh, steps of the procedure on the recipient where we'd set up uh, things without committing to destroying the face uh, in order to accommodate the donor meaning. So we would elevate the skin, tag the nerves, tag the vessels. And if the donor was stable, we would continue on with removing parts of the face of the recipient. If the donor became unstable, we'd have to abandon the uh, patient uh, preparation. Here you can see some of the steps, uh, mapping out the facial nerve branches. Those takes a few hours. Uh, we wrote down exactly what each nerve did. Um, you can see here some of the models that help us um, you know, figure out if we've set up the recipient uh, as well as we could, uh, the organ being transplanted from one room, to, to move from one room to another. Uh, the bony inset, you can see some of the team uh, working together, including our um, cardiologist, Brooks Edwards, and our uh, transplant physician, um, uh, Dr. Amer, there all along for the ride the whole weekend coming in and out. Uh, we were able to use these guides to trans, uh, transplant the entire uh, upper jaw, lower jaw, um, uh, including the teeth, and then connecting all the facial nerve branches. Uh, we were able to restore the donor face with, our, with the help of our uh, incredible anaplastologist, Gillian and Michaela. Uh, they practice with us in the cadaver lab on many sessions to try to perfect that technique. They, they use life masks, not death masks, meaning they, they put in all the material and the quality that they would for uh, creating noses and ears and other uh, shapes that they do in their clinical practice so that there's a potential for an open casket. Uh, here you can see uh, this is the, the them after... Uh, the, uh, the, the model is made and sutured back to the, uh, to the patient, uh, to the donor. You can see here the incredible work, the freckles, the little hair follicles, the, um, just, just the wrinkles, something truly remarkable. Um, the patient was um, kept intubated for a few days and then we woke him up and we, we held off on showing him his face until our psychiatrist, Dr. Josie, worked with him for a while until he was, had less swelling. Here you can see after Dr. Josie working with him uh, for uh, several weeks, through about three weeks, uh, this was the chance for him to see himself in the mirror for the first time. Our incredible photographers and videographers were there for us to enjoy it together uh, and remember these moments. You could see his brother and his uh, father, and then you could see Dr. Uh, Bradley, our ophthalmologist, and um, some of his family members. This is the moment he actually saw himself in the mirror for the first time. Um, something truly remarkable. And, as he's leaving the hospital at two months, you can see all these, these people that cared for him, including security guard, um, the clinical coordinator, a social worker, just look at the joy in their face. They loved him and they wanted to, they, they were happy for him. Um, you can see here a revision procedure we performed three months, five months later. So um, you can see here, we reconstructed the orbital floor. We connected some of the um, sensory nerves. We tightened up the, the skin structure of the face. Uh, and then this is him a week later. Uh, this is him. This is our patient two and a half years after surgery. Uh, you can see he has restored some of his form and, uh, and function was uh, maintained, the eyelid closure, the eyebrow elevation. Those were intact before and we did not damage them. Uh, he has a fairly symmetric smile, is able to close his mouth. He has some synkinesis. His two-point discrimination uh, is, is fairly normal. Um, our, our Dr. Salinas, our dental specialist and his team, uh, Dr. Regenator and Volts worked on, his, uh, on the donor teeth, uh, including placing Visilign uh, uh, fillings, uh, restored him to good form. This is the patient five years later. 
continues to uh, to feel better and uh, and function better. He can see uh, he's able to uh, do all the functions that he was hoping for. Close his mouth. Is able to swim. That was something important to him. Uh, he lost one of the teeth to some dental caries, and we're replacing an implant now for him. Um, he's been uh, with our surgical nurses, with other team members, just to you know to kind of look at pictures together and enjoy the times that uh, that uh, the journey that they that we've all been through. He's back to fishing and hunting, uh, and now he's even uh, talking to some groups on suicide, depression, second chances. Uh, and you can see just a short video of him. Uh, I wanted the real nose, a real tongue, real mouth, real teeth, real lips. You know, I wanted to be able to kiss my girlfriend, kiss my uh, kids, my niece and nephew. And uh, one of the big ones I wanted to do was go swimming. So uh, and we were able to accomplish that. It's incredible that he's just touching his face like it's part of him uh, himself. So um, and he also is someone that loves children, loves to play with children and during the 10 years that he was injured, uh, he avoided children because he didn't like the reaction he got from them. They scared them, and that was something he didn't like. And this was an amazing picture of just looking at a child staring at his face, not realizing that there's anything wrong at all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mardini, for an absolutely outstanding presentation. I think that really exemplified the amount of planning and teamwork it, it has taken to develop your program and, and pull off a successful case. Our next speaker is Dr. Bo Pomahawk. Uh, Dr. Pomahawk is currently a professor of surgery and the division chief of the plastic surgery at Yale School of Medicine. He established the plastic surgery transplant program at Brigham and Women's Hospital and led the nation's first male face transplant procedure in 2009. Subsequently, they performed the first combined face and bilateral hand transplant procedure in the US and have now performed a total of 10 facial transplants, including one retransplant. He's published extensively on standards of post-operative monitoring, management of VCA patients, uh, with particular attention to facial transplantation, and has over 190 reference works. We really look forward to hearing about the extensive experience uh, that Dr. Pomahawk has uh, been exposed to, and uh, look forward to hearing you talk Thank you, Dr. Pomak. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to present on uh, 20 years of uh, uh, face transplantation and my personal views of uh, progress in the field. Um, as we all know, the uh, mid-facial, but in general, facial defects are challenging, even if they're simple or simple appearing. Uh, the anatomy and composition of uh, uh, individual parts are really unique and almost impossible to replace. And of course, the problem gets larger with larger defects. So in light of that, we started our vascularized composite allo transplantation program in uh, summer preparing in 2005, um, gradually started working on uh, IRB protocols uh, in 2008 and performed our first transplant in uh, March 2009. To date, we have done nine phase transplants and one retransplant, so total 10 transplantations for upper bilateral extremity transplantations. We also had protocols for lower extremity and uterus transplantation. Now, if you uh, look at the, what was the state of the field back then, uh, New England Organ Bank, which is now renamed to New England Donor Services, had to develop donor consent. Uh, we had to negotiate timing of recovery which meant and presented significant challenges due to changes in organ recovery routines. And uh, we had to go to the hospital and actually beg for support. Um, on, from their standpoint, they had to trust that we can actually do it, but also had to provide the means uh, to write off the cost of the operation. All of these efforts were treated uh, with um, internet, uh, sorry, institutional review uh, board reviews as uh, clinical trials, and um, there were still a lot of unknowns whether we can truly do these operations technically, whether the phase would live, whether we can build a team, and uh, um, as you all know, the team sometimes counts 50 members or so, and then uh, the actual patient care, as no one has really done, or there were only anecdotal cases around the world, we had to expect, expect uh, the unexpected. Uh, what could be the surprises uh, in management of these patients. Now, if we fast forward to 2020 or 2022, 
Uh, now we have New England uh, Donor Services, uh, uh, who has laid the foundation for HRSA to designate uh, uh, VCA uh, face transplants as organs, and UNOS you know, therefore manages the VCA donation. Uh, the grant support is gradually drying up and, and the actual effort is being viewed as standard of care. So most institutions at this point don't really have IRB to perform face transplant. It's more about uh, outcomes and studying various aspects of face transplantation. And uh, at this point, uh, in numerous places in the US and around the world, we have documented that teams are able to perform the surgery safely and patients do quite well. Uh, surgical side of things, there are a lot of advances that have taken place over the years, and I sort of structure them as vascular, bone, motor and sensory nerves, uh, mucosal lining issues, glands, lymphatic tissue, and immune suppression management, all of which we have learned quite a bit over the past 20 years. The vascular design, initially, there was a lot of controversy whether you need superficial temporal vessels for full face transplant or whether facial vessels are alone uh, enough, and uh, we have um, hypothesized from the beginning that that would be the case, that we can actually use just facial vessels. And as it turns out, you can probably use only one-sided uh, facial vessels for mid-phase and full-phase perfusion, although it appears that bilateral veins are necessary. And this is a patient uh, where we connected only right-sided facial vessels. There is uh, um, no um, perfusion coming to the face from the left, and the patient is now seven and a half, eight years after transplantation doing very well. In terms of bone management, early on, it was a challenge to make sure that sometimes mismatched uh, donor-derived maxilla and patients' uh, own recipients' uh, mandible really match in some sort of a hybrid occlusion. And uh, um, I have to give uh, huge credit to Dr. Rodriguez, Lassus, and Mardini, who really pioneered computer simulation and the CAD CAM modeling that's uh, widely used in craniofacial reconstruction surgery. Uh, to, to adapt it to transplantation. And uh, uh, the companies that provide us uh, with uh, overlay model of, of donors and provide us ultimately with cutting guides truly make a huge difference in how fast and expeditiously we can perform the operation. And I think that has become a standard of care uh, with a great impact on the patient where we can really match the donor maxilla mandible in this case, both uh, to the recipient with the utmost precision. In terms of glands, uh, a lot of issues go back to the vascularity. As I've mentioned, if you include temporal vessels, you have to include parotid gland, and that creates either unsightly bulk and width of the face, or uh, it uh, requires a superficial parotidectomy of the recipient. Uh, so for that reason alone, we have uh, opted to leave the parotid gland uh, behind and uh, recover without inclusion of parotid gland from the donor. However, submandibular glands are always included due to their close proximity to facial vessels. And that's where we have seen a number of different issues. In the first patient where the submandibular gland had some sort of a leak, we saw a silocele. And after that, we started uh, using Botox to completely uh, paralyze the production of saliva in the donor gland. And that successfully treated the problem. Uh, for the radiologists, it always has been a uh, challenge to um, decipher the CT scan where they see two sets of subandibular glands, something they've never seen before. So communication with all kinds of uh, additional specialists and teams are very important. And we have also seen leaks from uh, recipients parotid. Like in this case, uh, we had trouble finding branches of the facial nerve, had to dissect through the parotid more than typically. And uh, this is the result, uh, silo seal on the picture B. So uh, now we use Botox also for the recipient parotid if there's any concern that there could be leak or violation of the capsule. Motor and sensory nerves, again, ties back to parotid gland, the, the intimate relationship of facial nerve as well as superficial temporal vessels. But the advantage of our approach that we had championed from the beginning, leaving the parotid behind, allowed us to actually get uh, to the segmental branches of the facial nerve as they're just exiting from the parotid on the donor recovery. And that creates opportunity for targeted renovation of the recipient's face, unlike uh, inclusion of the parotid superficial temporal vessels, but then co-optation of the facial nerve of the, of the main trunk, uh, which uh, leads to greater degree of synkinesis. This is a dissection 
that shows uh, our technique, which could be in the same way adapted to full face transplant. Uh, the uh, red arrow uh, points to parotid duct, and then you see multiple branches of facial nerve to various sections of the mid face that provide motor innervation of the face, and that's where they're co-opted with the recipient. We have also felt that it was critical to include sensory nerves and, and develop the little techniques for uh, that would allow us to get more length and, and include all of the sensory nerves, um, supraorbital, infraorbital, and buccal uh, for sensation inside of the mouth and mental nerves. These are the critical ones to provide sensation throughout the entire surface of the face. And by creating grooves and releasing nerves from infraorbital region and the floor of the orbit, you can really get enough length that uh, these nerves provide adequate, uh, um, adequate uh, sensory return. And we have shown over the years that uh, this is indeed something that uh, um, has led to better re innervation whenever we cannot uh, connect uh, the sensory nerves, the, the sensation is considerably worse um, and sometimes absent. Uh, we have studied it extensively and, and show that the sensation tends to plateau at around uh, 18 months, but uh, gradually actually probably continues to improve, unlike motor recovery, which definitely has a peak and stops. Um, our first uh, patient, uh, this is how we generally think about the defect and the, uh, the way that we uh, plan the allograft recovery, um, had uh, inclusion of the mid-face uh, structures, including upper jaw, facial nerve, and sensory nerve branches. In this case, it was infraorbital and buccal nerves uh, that uh, provided um, a sensation of the uh, of the uh, uh, inside of the mouth as well as the surface of the face. And every single patient afterwards was in a similar fashion designed and prepared uh, in, in, in the same standard. So these are all the patients that we have transplanted to date. Again, uh, nine patients, but ultimately 10 transplants uh, as our patient number five needed retransplantation a couple of years ago. And there's definitely, uh, there are a lot of successes, but also some failures, and I would like to share with you both of them. Um, we have seen improved social life and integration. Quality of life is, tends to be better. Uh, patients have been able to return to work. Many of them got married or were able to walk down the aisle with their, uh, their daughter. Uh, they uh, have regained oral competence, near normal sensation of the face, and we have been able to decannulate every patient from tracheostomy. And uh, in all but one, we removed the feeding tube. Uh, due to release of the scar, the patient have uh, restored their ability to smell, and uh, we have been able to protect eyesight in patients that are uh, that were struggling to provide uh, uh, protection of their cornea. But we've also seen the challenges, surgical complications. This is probably the most uh, com complicated patient that uh, really took a long time to. Uh, get under control. We saw a lot of swelling, um, thrombosis of veins, and then when we anticoagulated, there was bleeding. Um, so these are typical surgical issues, but uh, certainly um, create a lot more anxiety in transplant patients. We have seen fluid collections, as you have seen some of the sial seals and so forth, uh, dehiscence and fistulas of the especially upper palate, which had to be repaired. Um, but all of them were manageable, and in big picture, most patients actually don't have significant complications or reoperations. Rejections are also something that um, is fairly dramatic. This is our patient uh, number five, uh, six years after transplant, looking really nice. Everything was looking great, and then she uh, calls me uh, about a half year later with uh, swelling of her face that she has not observed ever before started to develop blisters. When we biopsied, we found out it was full thickness necrosis. And then the process continues throughout the phase despite adjustments of immune suppression and uh, various, uh, uh, various uh, uh, immunological maneuvers that we tried. She ended up looking like this in July, 2020. We had a long discussion with the patient about conventional reconstruction versus retransplantation. And ultimately she felt that the quality of life with the transplant was so significantly better that she wanted one more try. This is her after the transplantation. She continues to recover and do well. This is not unusual. There have been other places around the world. Um, the very, very first phase transplant patient ultimately had the chronic end-stage uh, rejection of the allograft. 
ended up losing big part of the of the phase and ultimately died of unrelated reasons. But uh, it's something that we'll probably be seeing. And although our patient had a very complicated immunological profile to start with, I would anticipate that uh, there is a finite life for each allograph, which we still don't know what it exactly is. Um, also, our first patient ultimately died 10 years after transplant, which we have uh, uh, reported. Um, and um, we were fortunate to be able to perform um, fairly thorough postmortem analysis, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, the demise of the patient was due to hepatitis C, which went untreated for decades in this patient. We treated him with uh, back in 2007. Uh, with uh, interferon and rebeverin, the only uh, anti-hepatitis C medications at the time with complete uh, uh, loss of the titer or zero detection of virus. And that, that was the case at the time of transplant. But unfortunately, he recurred, ended up uh, being treated uh, several times with the novel anti-hepatitis C medications. But uh, despite their over overall success, in his case, it didn't lead to control of the disease and ultimately he died of hepatocellular cancer uh, despite treatment with ablation. Hot topic in all of these patients is kidney function and this just shows the longest patient at the time, uh, 10 years uh, creatinine plot, which shows very uh, satisfactory function until the very last half year of, the, of his life, which probably was related to um, uh, failing liver at the time as well. But you can see if you uh, look very carefully before five years and 10 years after transplant that there are some chronic changes, even though his allograph remained perfectly functional and viable. And it's hard in his case to see what may have been the result of liver failure as well in the later stages, whether loss of hair is really a sign of chronic rejection versus liver disease, we don't know. The skin telangiectasias, the loss of pigment in the face, but there are certainly visible changes. When we looked uh, microscopically, the bone was perfectly normal and so was donor artery. There were no deposits or intimal hyperplasia, unlike many other uh, cases where that has been uh, the case. When we looked at muscle biopsy of the donor, there was both fibrotic muscle and normal muscle, but you would expect fibrotic muscle given the fact that the re of the musculature is not complete. So this may have been perfectly normal and not really sign of any sort of rejection. But when we looked at skin, there, that's where we saw dramatic differences with the loss of adnexal structures, a flattening of the, uh, of the epidermis and thinning of, uh, of the epidermis with um, increase of collagen deposition and uh, reduction in thickness of the dermis. And some of those could be signs of aging. The patient was transplanted when he was 59 or 60, died when he was 70. Um, some of it could be just aging, but certainly some of it appears to be hallmarks of uh, rejection. And ultimately, the cause of the patient's demise, hepatocellular cancer of his liver. So we have, if I were to summarize the 20 years, we have, I think, achieved major, major accomplishments in the field. The surgical technique has been standardized. We have figured out successful management of patients' immune suppression. I think we all see positive risk and benefit ratio, certainly at five years and most likely at 10 years and beyond, as long as the patient can maintain their face. And um, I do personally believe that face transplant should be the standard of care for selected patients, although the debate about who is properly selected and who is the right patient continues. But there are still things that we need to improve. Uh, the operations must be shorter. That will translate into greater safety. We probably should think about donor recovering team and the replanting team or transplanting team as two different teams so that not everybody gets tired during these 17 to 25 hour long surgeries. And we can still do better uh, in outcomes, whether it's um, due to our experience with immune suppression or whether it is uh, due to some of the advances that are occurring in the field uh, for uh, uh, motor and uh, sensory recovery of the nerves. So in, in summary, I would say we're changing reconstructive to truly restorative surgery, where restoration of human appearance is beyond anything that was possible before. The function of the new face is better than anything ever before um, and certainly far superior to conventional reconstruction. And with that, those are again our 10 patients and uh, incredible medical research and clinical team uh, where I probably have left a lot of people out, but 
certainly the key players are here over the years that we have had uh, this program running at Brigham Women's Hospital and now at Yale. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Pomak, for an amazing presentation describing the experiences of your teams, both in Boston, as well as what you're setting up at Yale. We really look forward to seeing what, what your team at Yale will accomplish in the coming years. And I, I thank everyone for joining us this afternoon uh, for this webinar. I think, uh, you know, personally, it's a, a really tremendous experience from two different institutions and two different approaches. Uh, I think the effort that we see that it took to build these teams to do transplants, whether it's one or, or numerous, uh, really uh, lets us reflect on what it takes to be successful in this field. One of the things it certainly it takes is, is funding. And I think that that's one of our very common areas of these really great clinical results that are, are beginning to, to now be repeated at multiple institutions. And how can we move the field forward in the future? There's a lot of research that we've done both in preclinical models and laboratories, as well as the first patients who've gone through these procedures. And I think that the future for us in, in the field is applying this more and more clinically and finding mechanisms to support ongoing research as well as clinical efforts. I think both Dr. Mardini and Dr. Pomahawk as clinical leaders in the field agree with me on, on this point. And we all look forward to the continued robust exposure to the patients who really can benefit. Again, thank you for everyone for joining us this afternoon. And we look forward to continued participation in upcoming webinars. Thank you.